I'm Paul Hollywood, and yes, I like my food. And that's lucky, because food is why Paul has come to Japan for the first time in his life. Oh. <laughs> he wants to expose himself to all this country has to offer, although thankfully that's not his bottom. <laughs> Paul's time here is about flexing his culinary muscles. That's an oyster, not a muscle. Paul is in Japan to eat. I've never been to Japan before. I mean, why would I? I'm a baker. It's all about rice and noodles, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I'm told it's now the number one destination for food lovers, and that's why I'm here. I'm on a bit of a mission to learn why this country is so obsessed with food. Oh, wonderful! To see if the food here is as good as everyone tells me. We like the junk food! <laughs> and learn why eating plays such a crucial role in all aspects of Japanese life. 350 English pound for that strawberry. Just think about that for a minute. And, you know, in a land of rice and noodles, Baker Paul may even discover the odd bap or two. Bread is amazing. I'm loving it in heaven. I'm starting my journey in the biggest city on Earth, Tokyo. Ooh, snazzy graphics. Greater Tokyo has over 38 million mouths to feed, and eating out is a way of life for the Edoko. That's what you call people who live in Tokyo, because this was originally a small fishing village called Edo. These days, Tokyo is paradise for food lovers. It has more Michelin stars than any other city in the world, and the Edoko have over 160,000 restaurants to choose from. Of course, when you find yourself in the middle of the world's biggest mega city, you could easily get lost. So for his first day here, Paul's got a guide, a comedian called Kilala, who knows and loves this city. Is that Godzilla? Godzilla, yeah! <laughs> the most famous Japanese actor! They'll be hanging out in Shinjuku. Crammed full of bars and restaurants, it's one of Tokyo's coolest neighborhoods. It's also home to half of the world's busiest railway station. I'm gonna be here for a while. I need to learn some of the day-to-day -day rules. So when you meet new people, just a bow. Oh, just a bow? Yes. Konnichiwa. Okay. Konnichiwa. Ah, right, OK. What's goodbye? Oh, goodbye. Sayonara. 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 Or you can say bye-bye. OK, bye-bye. <laughs> Paul has three weeks of intensive eating ahead of him. So what's called for is a crash course in Japanese restaurant etiquette and how eating out here differs from what Paul's used to back in Britain. British restaurant etiquette. Uh, learn to use your knife and fork, spend half an hour looking at the menu, then order what you always have. Don't dribble, don't throw food, pay the bill and leave a big tip. For Paul's first lesson in eating out Japanese style, Kilara takes him to a traditional tempura restaurant. Tempura Tsunahachi. Ooh, lunch time! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hungry! They've been tempura specialists here for nearly a hundred years. The chef is Mr. Kawata, or Kawata-san. So, yep. tempura. Yes, I mean, tempura. this is one of my favourite things, actually. Mm -hmm. So, what's he got on the menu, then? What's he got to offer? I'd like to ask him his omakase. Omakase? Omakase is uh, uh, he's going to serve what he thinks best today. Ah, so we don't pick it up to the chef? Yes, uh, because he is a specialist. He oh, knows yeah, the best, right? Uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about it. So you avoid the embarrassment of asking for the English menu, and omakase shows great respect to the chef, meaning you get the pick of the day's freshest ingredients. And when I say fresh... Let's move on to his batter, shall we? He's not measuring it, is he? He's just putting it in by eye. He knows what it should be like. Throwing a little bit of the batter in the fat to see how it's going to react. Here in Japan, we focus on one thing and master it, and we call the person shokunin. 
So he is the shokunin of tempura. Is that all he does? Tempura. That's his only job. He's been focused on tempura for 22 years. Wow. So he's a specialist. Yes, the so best specialist. When I do my trade, I'm a baker, but that's pretty generic. Mm -hmm. I, I cover a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But these guys don't. They concentrate on one particular thing mm -hmm. and master it. Yes. Best. So first course, tempura prawn. Starting with the head. Should we start? Yeah, let's eat. But before that, wipe your hand okay. with this. Yeah. Okay. And some middle-aged guy always wipe their face too, but please don't do that. Middle-aged guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're young, so... Yeah, uh. yeah, I won't do that. <laughs> All right, can you okay. just pick it up? Let's use chopstick. <laughs> it's got a tail, it's already got a handle. I'm not brilliant with these, but OK. But before that, Let's show our gratitude against the food. Okay. Itadakimasu. Like, thank you for food. Yeah. Itadakimasu. Okay, itadakimasu. Itadakimasu. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's good. Yep, itadakimasu. Oh, wow. Oishi. That's stunning. Say oishi. Oishi. It's so light. Melts in the mouth. Wow. If that's the start, I'll tell you what, I can't wait for the rest. Now, you may think tempura is Japanese, but this style of cooking was originally brought here in the 16th century by Portuguese traders. As with many ideas from the West, though, the Japanese have made it their own and turned it into a culinary art form. I mean, just look at that fish. Did he do that deliberately, or is that just the way it happens? He made it on purpose. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. Do you like that? Yes. I really love fish. Oh, this wakasagi has babies and eggs in his Lovely. belly. Yeah. Lovely. So he's doing a load more now. Please stop pointing with chopsticks. Why? It's rude. <laughs> okay. Just to put your chopsticks uh, back on the block. Yes. Chopstick etiquette is very important in Japan. You don't point, you don't leave them in or on your bowl, you don't stand them up in food, and you definitely don't stab food with the... Oh. No! It's childish. <laughs> like a five-year-old kid. Yeah, but no, five-year-old kids in like Japan are experts, aren't they? This yeah. is really... I'm really hungry. Yes. I reckon I could probably Please lose loads of weight in it. Japan. Because I couldn't get enough food into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I could have this every day. Arigato, chef. Oh, shit. Thank Very you. Fishy. That was fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. Final course, anago, or sea eel. And first up, Paul gets to enjoy the eel's spine, deep fried and tied in a knot. I was a little dubious about eating spine, but wow. It's like Paul crackling. That's bizarre. Great, though. It was like a Michelin-starred pork scratching. And the eel meat was even better. Wow, it was beautiful. How's Japanese fish? Mm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I did think that my local chippy back home was unbeatable, but that fried mm. fish was the best fish I've ever had. Really, really good. Really good. Really good. Eely good. <laughs> oh, is it British joke? <laughs> Kind okay. of. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I'm a happy man. Mm. Thank you for bringing me here. Yeah. This is spectacular. If it gets any better than this, mm -hmm. I think I'll move to Japan. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so, a quite fabulous start to Paul's food tour of Tokyo. And next up, a bit of myth busting. Apparently, Japan does do bread. I heard you're a baker, so yeah. I brought Japanese most popular bakes today. Really? Bread, yeah. Is it popular over here? Yeah, very popular. I fancy a loaf. This one is very fresh bread. In a can? Pan can. It tastes good. Well, I'll be okay. the judge of that. Wait, wait, wait. Don't eat on the street. Let's move to... Around the corner. So my quieter. Yes. So people can't see yeah. you. I mean, to be honest, I'd rather people didn't see me <laughs> eat this. 
So there's another little etiquette slap for me. Uh, apparently, you can't have food while you're on the street, while you're in the metro, while you're driving. It's not a law, it's just seen as impolite to eat in public. If you want a snack on the move, you find a quiet corner. Like this one. So, let's eat around here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nobody sees. I've got the orange one here. Orange, and I take strawberry. Oh, it smells sweet. Do not eat silicon to keep it fresh. Yeah. What the hell? How does it taste? It's a little bit chemically, you know, the flavours. Mm, I see. Artificial. It may not be the best bread Paul's ever tasted, but Kanpan did originally come to Japan after the massive Kobe earthquake in 1995. Oh, for emergency, for snack? I'm guessing flavour isn't the number one requirement for emergency rations. Yeah. Does it say anywhere here how long it'll last? Three years. Three yeah. years? Yes. Hmm? Is that the only bread you do in Japan? No, we have more. Because that's the only bread in Japan, I'm in serious trouble. So Paul's first experience of Japanese bread certainly isn't winning any handshakes. But next up, one of Paul's favourites, fast food. Love a burger. Favourite meal, cheeseburger, fries and chocolate milkshake, or just a big bucket of fried chicken. Tokyo has more Michelin stars than any other city on the planet. Uh-huh. At the same time, I've seen a lot of the Western franchises, oh, such as yes, McDonald's. Yes, Wendy's, Burger King, also, you know, KFC. Is that popular? Yeah, very popular, especially for Christmas. Yep, she's right, and this is brilliant. In 1974, KFC Japan promoted their fried chicken as the perfect Christmas meal. And the Japanese swallowed the idea hook, line and chicken dipper. A lot of Japanese people think, oh, Western people eat KFC on Christmas Day. What? <laughs> Christmas uh -huh. in Britain, you have turkey traditionally or goose. Yeah. But certainly not a KFC. My God, it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> do you think I need to reveal it to other Japanese people? I, I, do you it's know what? Very, I think that point sales. Interestingly, the big Western chains which dominate fast food worldwide don't have it all their own way in Japan. This advert is for Moss Burger, a homegrown Japanese chain that's right up there with Colonel Sanders and Ronald. Moss Burgers are big in Tokyo, and their popularity is spreading right across Southeast Asia. And one of their most popular offerings puts a very Japanese twist on the conventional burger. I mean, they've replaced the bread with rice mm -hmm. to make it Japanese. Yeah, like a translation. It smells like sushi. Oh, yeah? It's a beef! <laughs> I'm dying to see what this tastes like. It should be a little soy sauce tasted, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't drop any trashes, please. I'm not. <laughs> it does work as a flavour. It really does. Mm -hmm. It tastes great. The quality is all mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But it's not very practical as a on-the-move yeah. food. The tempura we had at lunchtime, that was a Portuguese import. But you've done it again. You've got that classic Western food mm -hmm. and turned it into some of this Japanese. I'm seeing a theme now in Japan. Mm. Wow. Just a great burger. Wow. Uh, well, I've had a... Fantastic day today. Mm -hmm. um, arigato. Thank you. Do I, I'll, do a West, I'll do a Western one as well. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Sweet. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy burger. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. I'm eating on the street. That's Paul Hollywood off the Bake Off. He's in Tokyo on the first leg of a delicious Japanese food tour. His aim? To discover why this is the most food-obsessed nation on Earth. Oh, this wakasagi has babies and eggs in Lovely. his belly. Yeah. Lovely. On Paul's second day in Tokyo, he's heading upmarket. His mission today is to find the very, very best high-end posh nosh that this city has to offer. Tokyo is the richest city on Earth, and there are a lot of people here with a lot of money to spend. 
And when it comes to buying food gifts, the Japanese are prepared to spend a fair bit more than us Brits. Food gifts in the UK. Well, it's a bottle of something nice and a box of chockies, isn't it? I'll sometimes bake a cake. Paul's in Ginza district. It's like the Knightsbridge of Tokyo, packed full of upmarket shops and even more upmarket shoppers. At its heart is Japan's answer to Harrods, Isetan. Isetan's food hall is where Tokyo's richest residents come to buy food gifts, and they're not here to grab a bargain. I've just been doing some maths, and this little box here, which contains five dried prawns with one, two, three, four, five, six prawn crackers. Guess how much that cost? 75 quid. Wow, 75 quid. Matsuzuka, beef, loin. Now, let me work this out quickly. You're looking at 75 pounds for 100 gram. Now, you normally get an eight ounce steak, don't you? Should you be paying? You've got to be joking. You'd be paying nearly 200 quid per steak. Wow. Gift giving is a very important part of Japanese culture, and the quality of what you give reflects the respect you have for someone. The food gift business in Japan is worth a staggering 30 billion pounds each year. You're thinking, I'm going to go to someone's house. Bit of a celebration, family get together, you think, I'm going to go and buy him a couple of melons. Oh, yeah, 230 quid. I mean, they're beautiful and all that, but 230 quid. Fruit is where the really big money's at in gift giving. For up to 600 quid, you can get a piece of fruit grown in a mold, so it has an interesting shape. You want perfect mangoes? Then you're talking up to 3,600 pounds each. And the current record is a pair of Yubari melons which sold at auction for £35,000. Of course, if you enjoy paying a lot for your food, then a Michelin star or three is normally a good indicator of a high price tag in a restaurant. And as I think I mentioned earlier, Tokyo is home to 230 Michelin starred restaurants. That's more than London, Paris, Berlin and Barcelona put together and more than any other city on Earth. What's even more interesting is that Tokyo can be one of the cheapest places in the world to eat Michelin-starred food, unlike our own fair capital. A Michelin star is a guarantee of high quality, but it also tends to be a guarantee that you need to check your overdraft limits before booking a table. At my favorite Michelin-starred restaurants, you're staring down the barrel of 400 quid per person for a taster menu. I don't go there that often. While Tokyo does do expensive, this ordinary-looking ramen shop is one of the world's cheapest Michelin-starred restaurants. It's only got 12 seats, meaning when it's open, there's not even room to swing a noodle. So Paul has popped in out of hours. Nakiryu's owner is Chef Saito. Bit of a Japanese Heston, isn't he? A bowl of his ramen noodles starts at just 850 yen. That's a Michelin-starred meal for under seven quid. It smells amazing. It smells delicious. One. Yeah, fantastic. For the British person that's watching this at home, what is ramen? Ramen. Mm. Ramen. It's <laughs> Don't worry, I can help here. Ramen is noodles in a tasty broth, usually with some meat, seafood or tofu plopped on top. Think of it like a, a posh pot noodle. The key element, according to Chef Saito, is the broth, or dashi, which he spends 10 hours making fresh every single day. So what's gone into this dashi? And how long has this been boiling for now? Today, the last ingredients to go in are dried fish, wet fish, and a lot of seaweed. What happens at the end when you've finished to everything in there? 
こ,ここに入ってる材料は全て捨ててしまいますもうだしとしてあのもう出し切ってあるので味もしないし、so、every chef in the world wants a Michelin star how did it make you feel? まあ信じられないっていう本当に信じられない気持ちでいっぱいです It smells amazing and for me to be here talking to a Michelin star chef I can't wait to try your ramen. <laughs> Ooh, nice noodle action. And so to the tasting. Paul is trying Chef Saito's celebrated spicy ramen with pork. Wow. And how good is it, Paul? Oh my god. Thank you. It is absolutely stunning. You've got so many things going on in your mouth. Think of、uh, the best chicken soup you've ever had in your life. This is that on steroids. And these noodles look so delicate. Am I meant to slurp this? Yes. I'm useless with chopsticks with noodles. I'm going to make a real idiot out of myself. It's the slurping means something because the slurping adds a little bit of air. The addition of the air brings out all the flavors. It's an absolute delight to eat one of these. Chef Saito's ramen is so popular that diners are refused a second helping so he can get more customers through the door. And he's even helped design what must be the poshest pot noodle ever. Wow, look at that. Pot noodle from Japan with the Michelin on it as well. That'd be interesting to try, but I'm not the one to try that. The sound man here is a bit of a, an aficionado when it comes to pot noodles. Ben, come over here. Come on, sit down. Now, because we didn't want Chef Saito to be the only one not slurping on a ramen today, Paul's brought along a little treat for him, too. This is the British most popular pot noodle. So, Ben could try yours, and if you wouldn't mind, would you try this one? So now we can have an international pot noodle taste challenge. I think he's in for a real treat here, but yeah, well, yeah. I, I think he's going to really love it. You might have to re evaluate his whole life. <laughs> I think he probably will, to be brutally honest. <laughs> have you ever seen a pot noodle put in with a ladle before? No. I don't <laughs> think a pot noodle's ever been touched by a Michelin star chef before. What does this mean? I don't know. He loves it, you can tell. Good. Is it? That's good. Is it better than the.、Uh... I'm never eating one of them again. <laughs> well, I think Japan won that one. Can I have ten, please? <laughs> Arigato. Thank you. Thank you. Right, come on, Ben, finish up. We've got to、oh, go. I'll take it with me. <laughs> It's no wonder that Chef Saito has dipped his toe into a pot noodle. Every year, the Japanese eat four billion cup noodles, as they're known in Japan. And they're obsessed with them. Annually, millions flock to cup noodle museums. There are four of them across the country, and the newest is just south of Tokyo in Yokohama City. And this whole building, which is substantial, very modern, very cool. Is dedicated to pot noodles and it's rammed, absolutely rammed. Who knew? Look what I've missed all these years. There's even a replica here of the chicken shed in which Japanese national hero Momofuku Ando invented the cup noodle as a way to alleviate post war food shortages. That's him again in this collage, alongside probably the world's greatest ever female scientist. And the man who came up with an equation to explain the universe. They really do rate cup noodles here. There's over 3,000 cup or pot noodles in here. Crazy, isn't it? At 95, Momofuku's last gift to the universe was the invention of a cup noodle that can be made in space. Great day out, you know, for the kids. Paul loves his bread. And his big worry before arriving in Japan was that this country is breadless. 
In the UK, bread is everywhere. It's part of our lives. When something's really good, we say, it's the best thing since sliced bread. In the Lord's Prayer, we don't say our daily rice or daily noodles. We say, give us our daily bread. And we sing, bread of heaven. That could go on. You know, after a life of baking, Paul's got a good nose for sniffing out a flowery bap. I noticed when I've been going around Tokyo, actually, that they do have bakeries. And I saw queues going around the block on some occasion early in the morning waiting for these bakeries to open. Then I discovered that the oldest bakery in Tokyo is actually just around the corner from the hotel. Paul's hotel and the bakery are in Ginza district, the posh part where Paul saw those expensive melons. All the shops are upmarket here, including Tokyo's oldest bakery, Kumuraya, opened in 1869. It's taken me aback a little bit, to be honest, because I thought this was predominantly a rice-based culture, but I never expected to see that in Japan. And so we observe the Hollywood in his natural habitat. The quality here looks amazing. It's precision. It's the crumb structure. It's the look of it. I mean, I'm really genuinely <laughs> shocked. And there's some stuff in here I really want to try, actually, because I've never seen them before. This one in particular. Could I try this one, please? Hmm, we may be in here for a while. Now, this is melon bread with cream. Now, I've never seen anything like this. But what I'm curious to see is melon really has no inherent flavor. It'll be lost in a bread. It smells of melon. I am actually getting melon. It's like um, a gloopy, blitzed up melon inside a bread that's light, it's fluffy, it's crispy, it's very sweet. A lot of the bread I saw, actually, was very familiar to me, but it did have a slight twist. Now, if you look at that there, it's a Danish pastry with cheese inside it. Actually, I prefer that over the custard. That's crazy. Can I try a scone? Plain scones. Bet they fly off the shelf. Now, the secret is, with a good scone, is the shine on the top, nice and straight at the sides, and a decent amount of raisins in there. I'm in Tokyo. I'm eating something that comes straight from the Queen's afternoon tea menu. I mean, that is staggering. Natural split down the middle. It smells like a scone. I didn't expect this. It's a fantastic scone. And next up, the Star Bake, a wholly homegrown Japanese obsession. It's called Anpan. An, it's like a sort of red paste thing, but pan, pan is bread, it's like it is in France. They make and sell up to 10,000 anpans each day in this shop alone. And when Paul asked nicely, they agreed to show him the bakery. Yeah, that fits. <laughs> the dough for anpan takes 60 hours to make. Now that's a slow rise. Then each morning they do the rest in here, kneading, rolling, filling them with red bean paste and baking thousands of them. The flour is wheat flour. Bread flour. Bread flour. Ah, OK. Shioto, sato. Yeah. Egg. Egg. And butter. So it is basically an enriched dough. And the bean paste is going in the middle. Hi. It's a bit like a brioche. And then you egg wash the top. Ah, nurimasu. Yeah. And then in the oven. Hi. How long in the oven? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. The Japanese eat around five million anpan every day, and it was in this very shop that anpan was invented by a retired samurai, Yasube Kimura, in 1874. And so to the tasting bit. He's good at this. About 20 years ago, I was in this academy of bakers, and we got offered jobs all over the world, and jobs were being offered for me in Japan. And I was thinking, they don't make bread. How wrong was I? I could have been living here now. <laughs> Making amber. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Oh, 
I'm trying to identify the flavors. This is the red bean paste. It's got the texture, a little bit of a kidney bean. Remember fig biscuits when you were a kid? And you got that chew. That's what it's like inside there. A hint of cinnamon in there as well. The bread is brioche-like, but it's also like the softest flowery bap that you've ever had in your life. They're really tasty. They're quite Moorish, actually. To be honest, I was gobsmacked. I mean, we've been making bread in the West now for four or 5,000 years, and I think we're pretty good at it. However, the Japanese have only been making it for 150 years or so, and they've mastered it already. The stuff in that shop was absolutely top draw. I'm impressed. Whatever they touch, they make the best of. So, after placing a big, happy tick next to baking on his Japanese bucket list, Paul heads off for dinner in Shibuya. This bit of Tokyo is most famous for the world's busiest pedestrian crossing, where up to 2,500 people cross every time the little man goes green. It's also home to the other half of the world's busiest railway station. Paul, though, will be all alone tonight at Ichiran Ramen, part of a restaurant chain where you eat in solo dining booths, massively popular in Japan. What you doing? But a very alien concept for a sociable Brit like Paul. Eating out in Britain is all about being with people. It's a shared experience with family and friends, chatting, gossiping, and laughing about Brexit, religion, or Love Island. The thing is, Japan has a population crisis. There are a lot of old people, a drastically dropping birth rate, and over 15 million Japanese live alone. Dashy richness, garlic. In a city where the work ethic leaves little time to socialize, fewer and fewer young people are finding it possible to easily make friends or find partners. Go with medium. And so a whole ecosystem has grown up to cater for them. This chain alone has over 70 solo dining restaurants right across Japan. This solo dining place where you're in a telephone booth. Chassu. Oh, yeah, poor glass of that. All you see initially is just crotch after crotch. You can't see anybody unless you sort of give it who's next door. The sauce might be too spicy for children. Oh, jeez. And they're mild. It's very strange. I got it. Oh, uh, certainly when they drop the bamboo down. Because the blinds are my own. You sort of going. It's weird. Mm, it smells nice. And I understand why they do it. The idea, I think, was built on the fact that women wouldn't want to be stared at eating on their own. <laughs> the fork, anyway. They could go into a private booth, enjoy the food on their own without getting stared at, and then wander off and do their own thing. <laughs> Nice water. <coughs> it's meant to enhance the flavour of the food by purely concentrating on what you're eating. As a Brit, I was more curious about who's coming in, what's that noise? Oh, there's another crotch. Rather than saying, that's nice food. <laughs> It's all these strange noises. It's just really bizarre. Eating, for me, is a sociable thing. So the thought of being in a booth on your own, I'm not so sure. You know, at the end of the day, Japan generally has got a problem with its population. They're trying to get the average births per family from 1.4 up. Going to a separate solo dining area is probably not the best thing to do for the country. You probably need to meet people. <laughs> Like a perfectly baked sponge, Paul Hollywood has risen to the challenge of eating his way across Japan and has reached his final day in the massive mega city of Tokyo. Now, you may know that Paul likes his cars, so we arranged for him to spend his last day driving himself around Tokyo in a go-kart, dressed as a ninja turtle. I think I'm in some sort of weird dream. Paul's taking a karting tour of Tokyo. Can you imagine them letting you drive go-karts around the streets in London or Liverpool? I mean, the closest thing you've got is an open-top red bus. 
Safer, yeah, but no fun. These tours are hugely popular, and everyone who goes on one gets to dress up as their favourite cartoon character. <laughs> Paul's companion for the day, however, has come in his own clothes. He's a man called Ladybeard. Ladybeard is, as you can see, an excitable cross-dresser. He came to Japan six years ago to pursue his stunt and wrestling career, and he fitted right in. Crazy guy. So how come, in one of the most conformist and conservative societies on Earth, Ladybeard has become such a big star? Bless you. I love you. The Japanese are a very special bunch, you see. Yeah. Because despite being highly conservative, they have a, a desire for the non-conservative yeah. in a way that I feel no other country really does. You yeah. know? So the Japanese are a hard-working bunch and living in a society in which you're forced to work 12, 14 hours a day, they enjoy leisure with everything they've got. That means that when people bust out, it's on like Donkey Kong. There's no holding back. It's all about letting off steam. Yeah, that's exactly right, because there's a lot of steam to be let off. Yeah. And that need to extract maximum entertainment value from everything the Japanese do, of course, extends into eating out. Tokyo is home to a lot of quite extraordinary themed restaurants. And in Japan, themed has a slightly more full-on meaning than it does in Britain. Themed restaurants in the UK. Sort of American diners in a shiny caravan. Greek restaurants with plastic pillars and a man playing a bazooki. There did used to be a burger place on the A1, which looked like a spaceship. Does that count? Oh, yes. When the Japanese do themes, they do themes. The choice includes sumo, samurai, Alice in Wonderland, moomins, ninjas, sexy topless men, prison, vampires, ghosts, toilets and even Jesus. There are hundreds of full-on themed restaurants in this city. We're heading now to one of these themed restaurants. That's right, mate. That's right. All right, Paul, let's just pull over here, mate. And at their first stop, they'll have to catch their lunch. Yeah. <laughs> you crazy guy, you crazy guys. <laughs> at Zauo, the fishing restaurant. You might have noticed we're sitting on a vessel. Yeah. This is quite the concept. You catch your own fish. Right. Pull it out, and then the very fish that you caught will be taken off to be cooked for you to consume. You have wow. a little, uh, little thing of bait right here. All right, here we go. This is weird, isn't it? <laughs> here, fish, 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 fish. Oh! 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 oh, 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 oh. It was a big one as well. It was a huge one. One rule here, you can't throw fish back and try for a bigger one. You catch it, you eat it. Hygiene and all that. Yes, mate. Yes, mate. Good, good. I've got you. I've got you, my no. friend. Come here. Oh! Oh, he's a big fatty! Oh, mate! Hey! Hey! Ladybeard's netted a madai, or red sea bream. Hello, madam. Thank you very much. Yo, up! Look at that, Paul Hollywood. Yes! It was amazing! A few minutes later, that fish that we caught turned up on a plate as sashimi. Holy moly, that's, that's fantastic. That's a lot of fish. Look at the presentation on this. All right. Let's give it a go. Give it a go. Itadakimasu. It's not bad. Yeah. It's fresh. It's fresh. I mean, I find that a delicacy. And the fact that you have to fish for it, it's a great idea. Great fun. Of course, after a massive plate of raw fish, the best digestif... <laughs> ..is a bit more urban carting. I feel like you're gonna drop a banana peel or something. <laughs> Don't Don't do it. Whoa! I should add, this has absolutely nothing to do with that very famous game, Mario Kart. No relation to Nintendo! None! <laughs> Next stop for our costume crusaders, Rio, a puppy cafe. And dog lover Paul is clearly in heaven. Although Ladybeard seems less happy. What's the gig? What are we doing? Hey, Paul, how are you? <laughs> Let's go look at this. You look like 
you're in the kingdom of doom. Hello, how are I you? Lo I love dogs anyway in puppies. You're slightly nervous right. around them, aren't you? I, um, uh, yes, I have an irrational fear of... Oh, God, this one's... Oh, God. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, mate. Hang on, I'm going to um, give you a little bit of the time. Lady Beard will stay over here and observe. Bit, easy. This process. Animal cafes have now spread right around the world, but it was here in Tokyo that they first took off properly. <laughs> and if, like Lady Beard, you're scared of puppies, you can find cafes filled with micro pigs, penguins, or owls. I'm not sure how you would really have this experience with an owl. All the dogs are actually therapy dogs, and they're used in hospitals and care homes. Although I don't think Lady Bird was finding it at all therapeutic. You've done really well, mate, considering Thank you. you don't like puppies. So we didn't even order a cup of tea, we just left. How do I prevent the dogs from leaving? Oh god, this one's trying to kill me. I'm just gonna go over the top like this. Oh jeez, what a view. <laughs> you didn't pay for that. <laughs> Poor Hollywood. Poor Hollywood didn't pay for that. Oh. For their final stop of the day... You're crazy, guys! Ladybeard has promised to take Paul to whole new heights of pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking off shortly. Oh, good. Please make oh, sure that your seat belt is securely fastened. Thank you. Oh! Oh, 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 my, oh my God! God oh, holy moly! <laughs> yes. You look out the window, guys. Oh, I cannot get the window. Look at that! Oh, yeah! It's brilliant, isn't it? Oh, wow! The front comes up. Oh, oh yes. Ooh. <laughs> this is relaxing. Could your seat work? <sighs> not, not a hunt. Oh, it does now! Oh, it does now! Oh, yes! Oh, this is... Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you've probably guessed they haven't actually left the ground. In fact, they're on the upper floor of an office block, repurposed as the posh end of a jumbo jet. Excuse me, could you please sit back, please? This is nice, this is classy, it's a place man. This is first class though, isn't it? Thank you. If you're sitting here and you're on a date, for instance, yeah. and you have another eight people sitting in here as well, I mean, it's pretty strange, isn't it? If I were brought on a date mm -hmm. here, I would be very happy. What do you call this? Yeah, I've waited all night for you to say that. <laughs> Shall we move on to the main course? Oh, what's happening here? Duck steak. Dear me, duck steak? Duck steak. Oh, my God. Wow. This is the classiest first class I've ever experienced. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank madam. Thank you very much. Wow. It's been a fairly odd time. I thought, I'm in some sort of weird dream. I'm going to wake up in a minute. This is actually the real world, Paul Hollywood. I oh, know. Every meal in Japan is eaten in a themed restaurant. I think it's very clever. Mm. I've never experienced it. Anything quite like this before. Oh. It's been a real pleasure, mate. You've really happy. introduced me to another Japanese culture, Fantastic. which I think has been fascinating. Well, I'm very glad that we could share such a wonderful experience together. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it. An extraordinary first week in Japan, and Paul hasn't even left Tokyo. I've learned a lot, and I haven't even left the voiceover booth. I'm Paul Hollywood, and yes, I like my food. And that's lucky, because food is why Paul has come to Japan for the first time in his life. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to indulge in all this country has to offer. And he's got some rather good moves, hasn't he? His time here is about exposing himself to the country's cuisine. Paul is in Japan to eat. I've never been to Japan before. I mean, why would I? I'm a baker. It's all about rice and noodles, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I'm told it's now the number one destination for food lovers. And that's why I'm here. I'm on a bit of a mission to learn why this country is so obsessed with food. Oh, wonderful! To see if the food here is as good as everyone tells me. We like the junk food! <laughs> and learn why eating plays such a crucial role in all aspects of Japanese life. 350 English pound for that strawberry. Just think about that for a bit. Welcome to Japan, Paul Hollywood! It's time for Paul to move on and explore the rest of the country. And that exploration is starting with a short day trip north for dinner. 
It's a trip Paul's getting very excited about because today he fulfills a lifelong dream. When I was a little boy, I was a bit of a train spotter and I used to sit at the end of the platform collecting numbers of all the trains. But there was one train I really wanted to see and it was in Japan. And it's the bullet train. Well, he's had to wait 40 odd years, but now Paul's train spotter dream is coming true as he finally rides a bullet train, or what the Japanese call the Shinkansen. And we were on the fastest of the bullet trains, capable of 200 miles an hour. After two and a half hours of high speed happiness, Paul's stopping off to pick up his dinner before his return trip to Tokyo and it promises to be a very different experience to eating on British trains. You get the lovely buffet trolley on British trains, chocolate bars, crisps, terrible instant coffee, inedible white bread sandwiches, the worst muffins known to man, and if you fancy something hot, microwavable hamburgers. Yummy. To learn about what the Japanese eat on trains, Paul's meeting up with Japan's most famous train spotter. Hello, Ken. Hi. Paul, Paul nice to meet you. Hello. Kan Sakurai has travelled the world photographing trains, and he's so famous here in Japan, they made a 50-episode anime series following his exploits. But those exploits weren't train spotting. They were Kan chasing his true love, Ekiben. I'm here to learn a little bit about Ekiben. Ekiben. Oh. Train. Yes. <laughs> a very fast train. <laughs> Um, can you explain what it is? Ekiben is a lunch box. Right. Eki means railway station, and ben is short for bento box, which is a traditional Japanese lunch box. Ekiben are said to be the best fast food you can get on trains anywhere in the world. And according to Kan, this shop sells the best Ekiben in all of Japan. So you recommend this one to go onto the train with? Yes. Interesting name. What's in this? <laughs> Can we take two, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come on, Cam, we've got a train to catch. Wow, that's a beautiful flavor of the rice and the fish together. Very traditional Japanese food. I like ekiben, ekiben. <laughs> and this one is the yes, best. Yes, yes. Kan said ekiben is very regional, so wherever you are in Japan, you eat those regional dishes, and it's a great way of learning a little bit about Japanese food. And uh, this is rice sandwich. A rice sandwich? Mm, yeah. Yes, of course. Mm. The Japanese eat their way through up to 12 million ekibens every week, and Kan is doing sterling work in keeping sales figures high. How many ekiben have you ever had? A lot? Um, maybe 5,000. 5,000? Yes, yes. 5,000 mm. ekiben? Yes. Where'd you put it, Kan? No one knows this cow. I'm only telling you because no one's here. I used to go to the trains and get the numbers of the trains mm. and tick them off when I'd seen them all. Mm. Is this something you've done, cow? No, no, I, I, I'm only... Only photo, photo shoot. Photo See, that's, shoot. Not real, that's not a real train spotter. Uh, it's about dedication, cow. <laughs> <laughs> After a quick night's sleep back in Tokyo, Paul's off on his travels again. His destination is Japan's ancient capital, Kyoto. And despite the crew minibus not quite having the excitement of the bullet train, a stop en route manages to give Paul a bit of a baker's buzz. I was feeling a bit peckish and actually so with the crew. And we saw this bakery, so I wandered over to have a look. And you will not believe what I saw. Nat, Nat, come in here, mate. Yeah. Mm. Just gone in for me breakfast, right? Middle of Japan. Look at that. 
the most freshly baked sandwich bread sold in 24 hours, and they did just under three and a half thousand loaves. They sold in 24 hours in the middle of Japan. Guinness world record. Honestly, you want to go and have a look at that place? The bread is amazing. I'm loving it, man, Evan. That place was a revelation. It had cakes, it had bread. It was absolutely incredible. In fact, I bought a sandwich loaf just to take in a van. It looks a little bit like a brioche. Shokupan is Japan's favorite loaf. It's incredibly soft, it feels like a fluffy cloud. And even in this rice-based culture, the Japanese buy and eat millions of shokupan loaves every single day. That's a very, 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 very impressive loaf. I'd have a sandwich with that any day. Having enjoyed a good bread hit, Paul's now arriving in Kyoto. Kyoto means capital, and for a thousand years, this was the capital of Japan. And look, it's still very beautiful. Lots of lovely old buildings and people everywhere in kimonos. Don't be fooled. Those people in kimonos are probably Chinese tourists. They've hired those kimonos, go wandering around the streets, taking selfies of themselves all day. One of the reasons Kyoto attracts so many tourists, kimono clad or otherwise, is that it's home to over 2,000 shrines and temples. This one's the Fushimi Inari, a Shinto shrine. And Paul's come here to meet Diane Kichijitsu. Give a little bow at the door. She adopted the surname when she came to Japan. It means lucky day. The mountain behind is actually what you're worshipping. The building is just in the front of it. Diane's lived in Japan for nearly 30 years, but grew up a few miles from Paul's childhood home. So tell me, Diane, I come all the way to Kyoto and end up meeting a scouser. I, I mean, what is going on? What's your story? How come you're here? No, I just came here as a backpacker. It was never a plan to stay, but I just kept finding things that I fell in love with. So why, you may ask, am I hooking up with a fellow scouser in Japan? Well, sadly, it's because of a diet. I'm vegetarian. Oh, are you? So... Do you find it easy to be a vegetarian in um, Japan? No. Because no. I, I see that you stock, whether it's fish or beef. Yeah. But you don't very often see vegetable. No. So maybe veggies are better off back in the UK. I think veggie food is pretty good in the UK these days, a lot better than the days when the only choice was a nut roast, Linda McCartney's sort of sausages, or just eat the vegetables. All restaurants do vegetarian options these days, and even Greg's famously do a vegan sausage roll. So what's Diane's go-to veggie option in Kyoto? I mean, what is Kyoto known for? Well, is it, tofu. Is it just, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, tofu. It's well known for tofu, which I adore. <laughs> I love tofu. If you get yeah. good tofu, yeah. I don't see the point of it. And cut to a local tofu restaurant. Yes. Paul has come to Kyoto for conversion therapy. Five delicious courses chosen by Diane, designed to make our Paul fall in love with tofu. It was as part of the vegetarian diet of Buddhist monks that tofu became so popular in Kyoto. And most Japanese now eat tofu every single day. So, what is tofu? It's made from soybeans. Soybeans. Yeah, so there's this very soft, like, silky tofu. Yeah. And then there's the harder tofu. Is that the rubbery one? Yeah, so I've, I've ordered a little assortment for you. Do you want to start with the hot one? So what is this, then? So this one is a yudofu, just regular tofu, just Ooh. heated up. I think. Cubes of tofu in water? Yes. <laughs> oh, delicious, thank you. I know. Aren't you glad you came? Oh, look at that. Before we eat, itadakimasu. 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 Ooh. Mm -hmm. Trying to read the reaction. That doesn't taste of anything. It does. So what's the point? It's like a beanie flavour. A mm. beanie flavour? <laughs> yeah. It has no flavour. Yes, it has texture of a slug. What's the next one? Well, this one's sesame. Ah, OK. Similar sesame. consistency. Mm. It's creamier, isn't it? I mean, you can taste the sesame. Are we selling you on it? No. Oh, come so, on. No, don't. Now, this one, what's this? That looks like chips. That's, yeah, that's the closest to junk food. It's fried tofu. The fried one? I mean, it was like you were just eating batter with nothing in it. Mmm. But we're getting there. I got an mmm really? there. Really? It's just sarcastic. Mm. Are you sure now? No, Absolutely. you just don't want to admit that you like it. 
And look Smoothie. how nicely presented it is as well. I know. Yeah. What's this one? This is just a basic tofu. Yeah. It's like the smoother one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. The <Lovely. laughs> Are we going backwards or forwards? Oh, jeez. <laughs> OK, this Rang. is my paradise. I'm, like, so happy here right now. So it doesn't matter what you say, I'm still going to enjoy it. <laughs> so this is my favourite. Mm -hmm. I love you, but I eat it loads. And it, this is made from what? The top of the tofu. It's taken off layer by layer. Mmm. I don't like it. I Not really... a bit. Well, to be honest, I was pretty neutral before this. And now I really don't like <laughs> tofu. I mean, the only one that's palatable would be the sesame. Oh. Okay. That doesn't mean it's good. It's still really, <laughs> really bad. It's healthy. So is running, but I don't do that either. <laughs> <laughs>Still got it, Paul. Right, back to the food. And not just any food, because Kyoto is home to possibly the poshest way to eat, not only in Japan, but in the whole world. Kaiseki. This is Kikunoi, a three-star Michelin restaurant which specializes in the art of kaiseki. Eating here feels like you're worshipping the food. Oh. This is where dining becomes a ritual. Are there elements of ritual in the way that we eat in the UK? Well, you've got to wear a tie at the Ritz. Some people say grace. Me mum always made us fold the napkins at the end of the meal, but I thought that was silly because she then picked them up and threw them in the washing machine. So what exactly is Paul getting for dinner? Well, he'll be served 11, yes, 11 courses of the most beautifully prepared food he's probably ever seen. After wetting his whistle with a bowl of warm sake. It's the best sake I've had. <laughs> Kaiseki is all about small but perfectly presented dishes using the best seasonal ingredients and it requires over 20 chefs to produce every meal under the watchful eye of Yoshihiro Murata, holder of seven Michelin stars and one of the most respected chefs on earth. This is here at the desk. First course for Paul is pickled plum in fish semen. What's up? In Kaiseki, presentation is just as important as taste. The Japanese believe you eat with your eyes first, and Paul's second course, a selection of appetizers, could hardly look more beautiful. Has two steps. Fascinating. Considering the first course, this feels really sweet in comparison. Third course, sashimi. That's raw fish. It's so big. Raw lobster, to be precise. Oh, no, I normally like lobster. <laughs> <laughs> the next two courses feature more raw fish and tofu. But it's wasted on me. I'm such a peasant. God, I'm getting stuffed already. Not even halfway through. Next, I did get some cooked fish. It's warm, which is nice. The fish is cooked beautifully. After a palate cleansing sorbet with a wasabi hit. Oh, the heat's kicking in. Oh, uh, yeah. That's not helped. Paul's on to course eight. Oh, that's better. A selection of extraordinarily beautiful salads. 
to barba bean. That's quite delicious. Cuttlefish. Number nine, yes, a lovely piece of beef. Do most people when they come here eat everything? Yes. Wow. Uh, I can eat everything. Really? <laughs> yeah. There's nothing of you. Don't worry, it's here, it's really. You're tying it in. Yeah, like that. <laughs> I mean, the meat dish was incredible. Inevitably, after course nine comes course ten. Kyoto style karashi sushi. That sushi rice topped with mint shrimp, an algo seal, egg thread, salmon roe, grilled nori seaweed, ginger petals, shiitake, mushroom, green peas, konomi herb, mushroom soup, namco mushroom, and black pepper. Yeah, that's just one course. Those last few dishes have been, been amazing. The final 11th course is right up Mr. Hollywood's Boulevard. Can you see that? A sponge cake pudding. It's amazing. <laughs> that meal was a lot of things, and all of them were superlatives. It's absolutely delicious. The most complex, the most interesting, the most fascinating food. But some of the raw seafood dishes that came in the first half were very challenging. Oh, dear mate. Chef's finished me off. I could sleep for a week. But the last six plates I had there was some of the best food I've ever had. And in real time, that meal took two and a half hours for Paul to finish. Can't believe how dark it is. I've been here for hours. It was light when I got here. After a big sleep, it's time for Paul to leave Kyoto behind him. Back on the bullet train and heading for perhaps the most ill-fated city on Earth. On the 6th of August, 1945, the most devastating bomb that any human had ever seen exploded above Hiroshima. The 15 kiloton atomic bomb was dropped by the Americans with the avowed intention of forcing the Japanese to surrender and ending the Second World War. An area of five square miles was destroyed. More than 80,000 people were killed outright, and in the days and months to follow, the death toll rose to over 140,000, nearly half the city's population, many dying as a result of radiation poisoning. One of the only buildings left standing was a commercial exhibition hall, the Genbaku Dome. Now known as the A-Bomb Dome, it's been preserved as a monument in the Hiroshima Peace Park. Today, radiation levels here are on a par with the extremely low levels of natural radioactivity present anywhere on Earth. Paul's visiting the park with a Japanese member of the TV crew, Mai Nishiyama. Mai's our fixer and basically she organizes everything for us in Japan and she's fantastic at what she does. I came here when I was 16 as a, a school trip, and we visited here and also vis we visited the museum. When I saw it that day, I couldn't sleep because all the images I saw were just so powerful. And when I imagined that that's what happened to human beings, that was just too much. I was told that this river was full of dead bodies because people were really thirsty and also they're completely burnt, so they just dive into it. And you can see lots of bodies floating it was chaotic. There was that debate, wasn't there, whether to keep this building. Mm. I'm so glad that the, uh, the, the Japanese government decided to keep it, because when you actually see it, you can see how powerful it was. It's, it's an amazing symbol for what happened. Yes. What's this? We dedicate the bell as a symbol of Hiroshima aspiration. So we've got to ring the bell. Hi. Around the world, Hiroshima is known as that city that was destroyed by the bomb. But in Japan, Hiroshima's getting a name for its food. The region produces the very best oysters in Japan, and throughout the season, people queue daily at the numerous oyster shacks along the coastline. And we're not just talking raw oysters with a glug of Tabasco. Hiroshima's oysters are massive, and one of the most popular ways to eat them is grilled with a cheese sauce. 
Little taste of the sea. It's unbelievably meaty though. It's quite delicious. Hiroshima's signature dish, though, is something which became popular as a direct result of the atomic bomb being dropped. Survivors, known as the Hibakusha, suffered terrible food shortages in their devastated city. Occupying US forces provided millions of tons of flour, and to use it, the Hibakusha borrowed a dish which originated in Osaka, a deep-filled pancake called okonomiyaki. Hiroshima's version of Okonomiyaki has become so popular that now one whole neighborhood of the city, Okonomimura, is an Okonomiyaki theme park with 25 restaurants serving their take on this iconic dish. So, how do you make Hiroshima-style Okonomiyaki? Well, Paul's about to get a cookery lesson from the owner of possibly Hiroshima's smallest restaurant. Toshiko Kajiyama. It's very small. <laughs> There's no messing around with Toshiko. Wallop straight in. I didn't even take my coat off and she's already cooking. I'll make a bit more room in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, oh. I for the fans for it. So what's in a konomayaki? Well, First off, it's wheat noodles doused in special Okonomiura sauce. Then a simple flour and water pancake. OK. <laughs> wow, that's got a smell. OK. Then put the noodles on the pancake. Add cabbage and bean sprouts. And pork. Then flip. Get underneath it. Why are you laughing? I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> so tell me about this dish then. Is yours the best one? No, the best one. She's nearly 80 now, which means she was born near the start of the Second World War. So you were alive when the bomb came to Hiroshima? You were four. Did you see it? Yonsai Wow. Then after telling me this heartbreaking story, she's straight back into it again, making a kind of mayaki. Yes, she was involved in the bomb, but life moves on. And that's the thing that really got to me. She's happy, cheerful, and your happiness, I, 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 it's infected. What will make me even happier? Can I try some? <laughs> it's delicious. Really good. Oshi. Oshi. It fills you up. Was that what the intention was? Tell me what you think of that. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> You're telling me now I can have a job here on a Saturday morning, so I'll fly from England. <laughs> I love her. She's great. I'm staying. I found a new mum. Come back. Paul Hollywood is on a bit of a road trip across Japan to learn why this country is so obsessed with food. And that road trip has just taken to the air as Paul has flown 800 miles south to Okinawa, a collection of Japanese islands known for being one of the very healthiest places to live on Earth.
Okinawa does have a lot of very healthy, very old people. This lot, all of whom are in their 80s and 90s, get up every morning at 6, rain or shine, for Lagio Taiso, the nation's morning exercise class. And it's not just regular exercise that accounts for their longevity. Okinawa is home to some ridiculously healthy produce. This is the Goya. It helps fight type 2 diabetes, psoriasis, eczema and acne. This is great for bowel movements. It's fantastic for your digestion. It's also great, apparently, as a hangover cure. Do you? Purple sweet potato. It fights cardiovascular disease and cancer. It's a good source of copper, vitamin B, fiber, potassium, and iron. This is Mizuku seaweed. It reduces cholesterol. It suppresses tumors. It cleanses intestines. It fights bacteria causing ulcers. It ups metabolism. It reduces fatty tissue buildup around the organs, preventing heart disease. It tastes awful. Am I the first English guy to join you on this? Oh, no, 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 no. No. James. Jamie Oliver. What? Be Jamie be. Oliver is here. <laughs> so this is an island paradise where they eat the healthiest diet on earth and everyone lives to be 120. Yes? Well, no, not anymore. You see, at the end of the Second World War, the Americans invaded Okinawa, and they've never left. Tens of thousands of US troops are still stationed on Okinawa. So that's the base over on the right there with the barbed wire. And with them, they brought the American love of fast food. McDonald's, KFC. Okinawa got the first Western-style fast food outlet anywhere in Japan. Coco's restaurant's over there. Burger King! And the effect of all that junk food is succinctly explained by Japanese fixer Mai. Lots of Okinawan friends of mine are quite chubby. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the homegrown junk food that's pretty much become Okinawa's modern national dish, so this is where Paco rice was born. It's not hard to understand why this island's waistbands are getting wider. I don't understand what taco rice is. I've had a taco before. Yeah, but it's instead of having a shell, they have rice instead. You better show me. Okay. It doesn't so, make any sense to me. Okay. I've got some facts here. Okinawa, once the healthiest region of the healthiest nation on Earth, now has an obesity crisis. 600 yen, please. 600. The generation that grew up eating American food is now reaching middle age, overweight and at risk of diabetes. And almost a third of Okinawa men now die before they reach 65. Bloody hell. How is that in any relation to a taco? Why can't they call it chili con carne? Because that's what it looks like, with cheese on top and a lot of cheese on top. I mean, it's delicious. And hot. Is it? Spicy. No. What is that, salsa? Salsa sauce. I'll try a little bit. Ah, oh, that looks like taco. No, it doesn't. <laughs> this is taco. That's not a taco. This is... No, it's not. Yeah, no, by it's Japanese not. standards. No, even by Japanese standards, <laughs> that's not a taco. Okay. I can't believe he's got the audacity to call it King, King Tacos. Taco, yeah. These chaps are the Shima Bananas, a group of middle-aged surfers who could all do with shedding a few pounds. But they've attempted to do their bit to fight obesity in Okinawa by recording a song called Meat Tech. Wow! M -m Meat Tech! Hala, kiri, kiri, hala. 
Meat tech is what they call that extra bit of insulation that the Okinawan men carry around their waists. And the song encourages Okinawan men to get active and lose their meat tech. I'm happy to watch. However, watching the Shiman Bananas perform their song, it's clear that they weren't taking their own advice very seriously. A day's surfing often ends with a beach barbecue. OK, everybody! Yay! Cheers! Cheers! And that's where the Shima Banana's healthy lifestyle philosophy abruptly ends. <laughs> I wanted to bring something Okinawan. I was going to a barbecue and I thought, I'll bring something that I know is healthy because they'll all keep fit and surfing. Guys, yeah. you should be eating this so you haven't got the belly, yeah? Ah. At Paul's end of the table, Goya, seaweed, purple sweet potatoes, fresh fish, and a host of other traditional Okinawan food that'll probably make you healthier just by looking at it. What do they do? They bring a load of meat to start eating like a Western barbecue and not one from Okinawa. What about this? Oh, this is a Guruko Okinawa soul food. Why aren't you eating this then? Oh, we, we like the junk food. <laughs> <laughs> we love junk food, you know? No one touched any of the food from Okinawa. They all just tucked into the ribs and the, the pasta. So when you were a little boy, mm -hmm. did you eat this? Junk food, fast foods? Well, not much. We used to eat the fish, you know, vegetable. Yeah. yeah. Then the culture is changing, you know? Mm. You blame the Americans for you eating this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think that barbecue encapsulates everything in Okinawa. I think that's what Okinawa is now. Yes, you have all the vitamins there and all the healthy food if you want it. And certainly the older generation eat that way. But the next generation down all eat the Western stuff. And that's down to the Americans, the GIs bringing it in. And it's changed their culture. Okinawa, I hope, is not the new face of the rest of Japan, but I can see it seeping in. Hollywood is in Japan, learning why this is the most food-obsessed country on Earth. And since he arrived here, it's become clear to Paul that there's one food the Japanese are more obsessed with than any other. Almost every meal you will ever have in Japan involves rice in some way. You get it served with, in, on, after or before everything. This is a rice sandwich. Because of rice, Paul's now travelled a long way north to finish his second week in Akita province and the small town of Misato, which spends every winter under a few feet of snow. In the summer, though, this place is a sea of green, and most of the town's 20,000 inhabitants make their living through rice farming. Paul's come during the snowy season for one very good reason. He's here to take part in an extraordinary rice festival, which apparently predicts whether the year's rice crop will be a good one. It's called the Takeuchi Matsuri, and it's a festival that promises to be a whole lot more hazardous than anything Paul's experienced back home. British festivals. Well, there's the Harvest Festival, of course, where we put the fruit in the church. Book festivals. Done a few of those selling books. Does Glastonbury count? Look at that, Paul. There's a rice paddy fields. All of them are rice paddy fields. Joining Paul for the festival is Saku Yanagawa. I grew up in really countryside of Japan, yeah. like surrounded by rice paddy fields like that. Saku is a Japanese comedian who, like every child growing up in Japan, was left in no doubt about the importance of rice. All the mother told us, if we cannot finish every single piece of rice, we will go blind. <laughs> On average, every single Japanese person will eat four and a half tons of rice in their lifetime. And there are a lot of different types of rice. Yeah. 300. 300? Yeah. I only know two, a brown and a white. <laughs> As night falls, we rejoin Paul and Saku, already dressed for battle, arriving at their team's headquarters. Arigato. Um, turned up with Saku to a site which I wasn't expecting, to be honest. They were all drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking sake, wine, beer. <laughs> was that bottle full an hour ago? <laughs> yeah. That was a little bit worrying. 
So what exactly has Paul let himself in for? Can you ask what's going to go on? What does he want me to do? あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
then, after some more aggressive pole rattling, the final fight kicks off. So I ran in again, got the bamboo stick down. The next minute, I locked in, and then poles came in and around my legs. I couldn't move. And then two poles started coming towards my face. And I thought, if I fall over, I'm in a world of trouble. And the whole scrum started rotating. It actually encroached onto where the audience was and our cameraman now. Thank goodness it didn't go the other way towards the fire, because that would have been ridiculous. It was then that they called it. They realised it was getting a little bit dangerous. So it was called off, and that was the end of it. Well, that's that's a lot. That was uh, that was actually quite dangerous. Yeah. My both my legs were beginning to creak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we got caught. It was quite scary, exactly, actually. Yeah. Thought, it was like a jail. All of this for rice. I mean, yeah, yeah, for rice. Yeah. But actually, to hope they have a good year, well, the fact they just wiped that off the farmers already. So all we can do is to wait for the result. Yeah, I think we know the result. Yeah. The Northern has lost. It's because the Southerners just had more money. Paul's Northern team did indeed lose. But that does apparently mean the price of rice will be high this year, which has to be a good thing for everyone here. And it doesn't stop his team heading back to the village hall for a celebratory feast and a few more drinks. Arigato. There's a little bit of a celebration, there's a bit of a drink. This is uh, oh, a chicken. chicken. Japanese fried chicken is good. You were doing something special and you've just fought for a, a part of a town. I really enjoyed it, actually. That was a fun festival. Yeah, it was an experience that you remember. <laughs> yeah. This is part of their culture. This is a big thing. And it's a big family occasion to watch everyone getting pulled off to a and &E. yeah. But sitting down at the end of it, and we all had the food, it was magic. Yeah, the chicken's lovely. And I felt part of this team. I was, I was fighting for them. It was a really special night. Thank you for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so a spectacular end to Paul's second week in Japan. I'm Paul Hollywood, and yes, I like my food. And that's lucky, because food is why Paul has come to Japan for the first time in his life. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to expose himself to all this country has to offer. Although, thankfully, that's not his bottom. <laughs> Paul's time here is about flexing his culinary muscles. That's an oyster, not a muscle. Paul is in Japan to eat. I've never been to Japan before. I mean, why would I? I'm a baker. It's all about rice and noodles, isn't it? Ta-da! <laughs> anyway, I'm told it's now the number one destination for food lovers. And that's why I'm here. I'm on a bit of a mission to learn why this country is so obsessed with food. Oh, mental! To see if the food here is as good as everyone tells me. Yeah, we like the junk food! <laughs> and learn why eating plays such a crucial role in all aspects of Japanese life. 350 English pound for that strawberry. Just think about that for a minute. And Paul being Paul, he's bound to find a way to get bread involved somehow. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Japan, Paul Hollywood! Now Paul wants his final week in Japan to be all about seeking out the most weird, wonderful and astounding food stories this country has to offer. And his first stop promises to be right up there as one of the most astounding places he's visited. Paul's heading deep into the Japanese countryside for an extraordinarily fruity experience. He's going strawberry picking. It's pick your own in the UK, isn't it? Spend a day in the field doing the farmer's work for him, getting sunburns and eating as many as you can. One in the basket, one in your gob, and then you feel a little bit sick on your way home. In Gifu Prefecture, about 30 minutes' drive northwest of the city of Nagoya, is the Okuda Strawberry Farm. At first sight, it doesn't look that special, and Paul, 
Well, he doesn't look very impressed, does he? They were telling me this guy's got some amazing strawberries, you know. I've seen better in the UK, if I'm honest. One pound fifty a punnet, I think they're about two quid in the UK at the moment. I mean, they look OK. Oh, he's got a few down there, some at 8.50. Foot are gone. Let me just double check. 17 quid. Can't be right. You know, everyone's experienced strawberries before. We're British, for goodness sake. Apparently, we make the best strawberries in the world. And sometimes you might even pay five pound a punnet, and you go, oh, that's quite expensive. It's a bit of an extravagance. But as a slightly confused yet intrigued Mr. Hollywood heads inside the farm shop, even 17 quid for a punnet starts to look like a bargain. So 140 quid for that box of strawberries. Has he made a mistake on it? Has he made a mistake? Hang on. I don't want to buy the place, I just want to buy a strawberry. £16 of strawberry. <laughs> I'm going to find out about this. This is owner and founder Mr Nichio Okuda, Konnichiwa. who has been growing strawberries for 45 years. Um, I see your strawberries go up in value all the way up to 20,000 yen for this box. The prices are very, very expensive. What makes your strawberries the most expensive I've ever heard of? He supplies these mega money places with these beautiful strawberries, and I thought, what's it going to taste like? Oh, it, it's it's incredible. It's almost rose-like in its flavour. It's juicy. Juicy. It's definitely the most impressive strawberry I've ever eaten in my life. And eventually showed us where he grew the strawberry, these polytunnels which was really hot, by the way. I mean, humidity level's like 90%. It's a bit warm in here. <laughs> in Japan, almost all strawberries are grown like this, under plastic through the winter months. The long, slow ripening is said to make them sweeter. Wow, look at the size of these fellas. <laughs> They're huge. Okay, okay, they're okay. I was always thought the bigger the strawberry, more the water, less flavour. Oh. <laughs> but I was so wrong. Oh, Maru, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my word, that's fantastic. Oh, <laughs> gee. Mm. What is it that makes your strawberries the best in the world? Now, Paul may think he's already had the best strawberries he'll ever taste, but incredibly, Okuda-san has kept the best till last. Where's it gone? Ah, more strawberries. This is a new variety which Okuda-san has spent the last few years perfecting. Remember the colour looking at it going, wow, they look really red. Tell me about this, what's this then? This Yeah. This strawberry is now thought to be the very best you can buy in the whole world. Wow, that's intense. It's heavy. How much is this strawberry then? 50,000 yen! I don't want all of these, just, just one. Wow. I didn't know what to say. 350 English pound for that strawberry. Just think about that for a minute. I mean, it's such a leap from 20 to 350 pound. Do you drive a Ferrari? 
<laughs> you do, don't you? Oh. You have a set of Ferraris around the back there. I have never drank or eaten any food that's more expensive than that. Would you mind holding that for me a second? Thank you. This is all my money. Two, three. I understand this guy. His passion for strawberries is incredible. He invented this. He, he grew this thing. For strawberry! <laughs> 50,000 yen, my friend. Thanks, Del. <laughs> I'll give it a go. It's like, um, <laughs> makes you happy. He's happy, he's got 50,000 yen. But it actually makes you really happy. It's like, it's like an apple meets a strawberry, meets a grape, meets a whole bunch of red roses that you smell in. And it's just beautiful. He creates the best strawberries in the world, without a shadow of a doubt. Wow. Wow. Okuda San's biggest ever single sale was for this variety. There's about five of them. <laughs> a man bought one strawberry for each of his 17 party guests. And the price? £6,033. <laughs> Even the stalk tasted good. You don't matter. <laughs> It's going to be hard to top a £350 strawberry, but Paul's certainly up for the challenge. That's Paul Hollywood off the Bake Off, and he's on a food tour of Japan. See, there's some sushi. It tastes really good. <laughs> oh, wow. In his final week here, he's searching out some of the weirder and more extraordinary stories I've never seen anything like it. this food-obsessed country has to offer. Do you drive a Ferrari? <laughs> 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 you do, don't you? And if we're talking about Japanese obsessions, then we have to talk about the cherry blossom season. The Japanese love of cherry blossom, or sakura as it's known here, puts British celebrations of spring firmly in the shade. Celebrating spring in the UK? Uh, well, there's a blue bell wood near us. Loads of people stop and take selfies and park everywhere. Uh, we get May Day bank holidays, yeah! Do people still dance around maypoles and Morris dancers? Are they part of the spring celebrations? I'm not a fan of Morris dancers. It's fair to say that the Japanese go utterly bonkers for cherry blossom. Throughout spring, the weather forecast ends with a daily sakura update, predicting where the blossom will be best. And right now, that's in the town of Kawazu, on the Izu Peninsula, where the pink trees and the crowds who've come to see them stretch for a couple of miles along the riverbank. Paul's come too, with Yuriko Kotani, a UK-based Japanese comedian who's flown home specifically to show him the cherry blossom. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Look at the colours. It's beautiful pink. Just uh, make you content, isn't it? I think happy. Yeah, 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 yeah it yeah, does. Yeah. I must admit, yeah. I'm a bit of a grump, to be honest. Uh, but when you look down there and see yeah. this... Yeah, look, it's just the tunnel. <laughs> it's the beginning of the year kind of feeling. Yeah. And also, these beautiful flowers uh, doesn't last long. Yeah. So we appreciate the moment as much as we can. It's like a... Sunshine in Britain, you know. Like, well, yeah, when, yeah. Almost half of Japan's 126 million population take part in blossom themed hanami picnics every year. And for those that don't bring a picnic, there's row after row of food stalls. They have a saying in Japan which Yuriko taught me Hana Yori Dango. That means food over flowers. So, yeah, come and enjoy the pretty pink trees and get stuck into your food. There's a street food feast on offer here. But sugar is really the thing. In times past, sugar was a luxury only enjoyed at festivals. So this was, and still is, a chance to overdose on the sweet stuff. Mm. And of course, a lot of it comes in just one choice of color, pink. Like taiyaki, fish-shaped pancakes stuffed with pink custard cream. Sure, the custard inside is delicious. It's the bubble gum on the outside, I don't care. And sakura-flavoured mochi, that sweet pounded rice. 
Last time I had a texture like that, I was wallpapering a wall. Wallpaper? Is there a bin around here anyway? <laughs> it's not just at the festivals where everything turns pink. You walk into a Japanese supermarket in spring and there's a Sakura flavoured version of pretty much everything you can eat. Look what I bought, a cherry blossom Kit Kat, that classic British chocolate bar, and it's a Japanese obsession. Throughout Japan, the Japanese love their chocolate fingers as much as they love their cherry blossom. So far, Nestle have launched over 400 different flavours of Kit Kat in Japan, and every day the Japanese eat 5 million of these little chocolate bars. That's almost 2 billion every year. Appropriately, on a very small picnic rug under the sakura trees, Yuriko has gathered together an impressive selection of Japan's favourite chocolate bar for Paul to try. I don't understand what a Japanese Kit Kat is. This is a Kit Kat. Yeah. That's... Milk chocolate, wafer, that's the proper one. There are so many flavours. That's chestnut. Chestnut? Yeah. So what's that one? Can you guess? Uh, nettle? It's wasabi. Wasabi Your favourite, yes. That's horrible. <laughs> I mean, these sold all over the country, are they? Yes, and we do regional ones as well. For example, this is uh, from Tokai area, my region. It is Azuki red bean toast sandwich. Kit Kat's huge popularity here is largely due to the fact that the Japanese view this chocolate bar as being lucky. In Japanese, we got a phrase. Right. Kitokatsu. Kitokato. Means, uh, like a win for sure. So Hopefully you win. Thing. Yeah, like a good luck charm. What's that one? Oh, that's matcha. Tea. Matcha yeah. green tea. That what is revolting. <laughs> I mean, how dare they do that to a Kit Kat? So I'm just wondering, like, why don't Britain do similar thing? For example, donut flavour. I suppose you could do a roast beef. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yorkshire roast pudding. Beef. Yeah. Fish and chip Kit yeah. Kat. Cornish pasty. If you caught up with a Cornish pasty Kit Kat, yeah. me and you were going to fall out. <laughs> Because I promise you, Cornish pasties stay in a rough puff pastry. <laughs> they do not, and I repeat, do not ever go in a Kit Kat. No. Paul has, of course, enjoyed a good few chocolate fingers as he's travelled around Japan. And as we've seen, he's also discovered that the Japanese are dab hands at another of his favourites, baking. I'd have a sandwich with that any day. But man cannot live by bread and chocolate alone, although that is an attractive thought. While exploring this extraordinary country, Mr Hollywood's also put away a fair number of bentos, the traditional Japanese lunchbox. Oh, that's good, Simon. The Japanese eat their way through billions of shop-bought bentos every year. However, most parents still prepare bento boxes at home every day for their kids to take to school. And the care they take doing it puts us Brit parents to shame. My mum never exactly lavished love on my packed lunch for school. Cheese sandwich on sliced white, carton of orange juice, ready salted crisps, chocolate bar. And then she lobbed in an apple, which spent most of the morning bouncing round in the Tupperware box and was covered in bruises by lunchtime. To mummy. Hey. Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How'd you start with the rice? Yeah. <laughs> this is Tomomi Maruo. She laughs a lot. <laughs> But she's also a bit of a bento artist and has become a YouTube sensation in Japan, teaching parents how to make the most extraordinary bento boxes for their children. i tell you what, the sticky rice is really proper sticky. And today she's teaching Paul. I mean, proper <laughs> so you sticky shouldn't rice. <laughs> well, Auntie, you have to, don't you? <laughs> Tomomi makes Kiara Ben, which are character bentos. Food styles look like celebrities and cartoon characters. So I thought I'd make a Chiara Ben based on the Bake Off team. Me, Prue, Sandy and Noel. Let's face it, it's going to make the character bento box look amazing. Put soy sauce to put colour on the rice. I'm, I'm trying to be brown. <laughs> Me too. Because I have I a pair of tan. <laughs> Noel's very white because he's a vampire. <laughs> Tomomi started out just making Kiara Ben for her kids. They requested me what to make. What so did they want? First, cartoon characters. Uh. But when other mums started asking for lessons... Use this fish cake. Right. 
she started making videos for the internet. You look angry. I do look like an angry sumo. Yeah, right. Some more restaurant. I didn't wait to agree with that. <laughs> and now Tomomi has a large and loyal online following. Vampire. No. Because he's dead. He died five oh. years ago. Sorry for him. Kiara Ben has become massively popular, and parents now compete to make sure their kid has the best and most stylish packed lunch. Doesn't need to be competitive, right? Yeah, but you'll always get competitive mums and competitive dads. I've been in a school sports mm. day. <laughs> Forget fancy trainers. If you want status in a Japanese playground, you need to be revealing a brilliant Kiara Ben every time you open your lunchbox. <laughs> Sandy. She's got a little <laughs> scarf on. Kawaii, cute. I'm trying to work on prune now. Can I take some of that ham, please? It's all got so competitive that some schools have now banned Kiara Ben to try and restore peace in the playground and at the school gate. So you've started a big problem now in schools. <laughs> The faces were basically rice balls with a bit of dressing, but to finish off the bento boxes, Tomomi had me making a whole load of other decorations out of a whole variety of other food. Like a heart shape? How clever is that? You know in the UK we say you should have your five a day. Rose. Mm. Kawaii, kawaii. Oh, yeah. Well, in Japan they say they should have 30 different types of food every day as part of a balanced <laughs> diet. I'm really happy with that. Noel's even got a broken nose. No. <laughs> Arigato. Do it as much. That is fantastic. <laughs> Although two and a half hours to make a lunchbox. Back to Kit Kat and an apple for me. I brought a gift for you. You brought a gift for me? Yeah, ta da! <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Arigato. Do it as much. I hope you like it. That is fantastic. <laughs> I think I'll sit there quite well. You've even given me dark hair. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> Paul Hollywood is eating his way around Japan, learning why this country is so obsessed with food. It's just beautiful. And in his last week here... Ta-da! Fantastic. <laughs> ...discovering the weirder ways in which food permeates every aspect of Japanese life and culture. That's horrible. <laughs> And nowhere is that more evident than on Japanese television, where their obsession with food is on a whole different level of weird to the channels back home. Food on TV in Britain. Well, we've got lots of television chefs, haven't we? And we've got a fair few competitive food shows. The best of those is one called The Great British Bake Off. You might have heard of it. <laughs> Food dominates Japanese TV and features in a massive number of programmes. There are hundreds of food-based game shows, thousands of food-based anime, endless cookery shows and food documentaries. And amongst the most popular shows on Japanese TV are the huge number of what are called gourmet dramas, which follow the main character as they go for dinner and, well, that's it. The Japanese love food-eating contests, too, many of which get broadcast live on national TV and attract millions of viewers. One of the most popular is the All Japan Wanko Soba Contest, held in the small town of Hanamaki in Iwate Prefecture. Here, food fighters compete to eat the most bowls of noodles against the clock. Now, the big competition is only for professional food fighters, and they train for months to take part. But I've been told that anyone who comes to Hanamaki can take on the eating challenge and, well, I love noodles. As Paul never likes eating alone, today he'll be going head-to-head -head with a pair of famous big eaters as they shoot a video for their YouTube channel. Paul <laughs> Sanders! <laughs> The Harapeko twins, Kako and Akko, are part of a YouTube phenomenon, which has swept across Japan in the last few years. They video themselves eating ridiculously huge plates of food and then post it online. And millions, and I mean millions, of people watch them. 
I found it fascinating with those twins because literally I could put my arms around them and slap my own face, probably both of them at the same time. What's the most amount of food you've ever eaten in one sitting? Wow. Obviously, I'm a big lad. So, what I want to know is how do you stay so slim? <laughs> and then, once everything is in place, it's time to eat. Right, let's bring it on. The challenge lasts 20 minutes, and every time they finish a bowl, it gets refilled by the ladies in kimonos. Give me a minute, yeah? The empty bowls are piled up to show how much you've eaten. And before you ask, wanko means bowl in the local dialect. Oh, mental! I'm struggling, to be honest. How far in are we? 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes? <laughs> Having managed only 14 bowls, Paul's Wanko Sober Challenge comes to an early and abrupt end. Bomb. Come on, Paul. I can't, mate. I'm, I can't have any more. That's mental. <laughs> like machines. But while Paul is beaten, the twins are only just hitting their stride. <laughs> that, that's just... I've never seen anything like it. I mean, look at the size, that's what baffles you. The miniature. It's extraordinary. This eating challenge apparently dates from the 17th century when a high ranking local landowner visited Hanamaki. It was a poor town, and the people were embarrassed that all they had to offer him were simple soba noodles. Can you hear the belts in bed? To try and make the meal appear more sophisticated for their posh guest, they served the noodles in a small, delicate bowl. The landowner loved the noodles and asked for another bowl, and then another, and then another. And thus, the Wanko Soba Noodle Eating Challenge was born. Apparently. Six, five, four, three, two, one. That's it. How are you feeling? I've never seen anything like that. That is crazy. These days, people travel from right across Japan to take the challenge, and most of them manage a lot more than Paul. You see, I did this. <laughs> That's mine. Yeah, yeah. I'm very proud. But when you look at that, <laughs> it is staggering. Absolutely staggering. You must be quite an expensive date. <laughs> As the bowls are counted, the twins are keen to show Paul how hard they've worked. Are you sweat? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> and so to the result. In uh, third place is me. Hey. Yay. Thank you. I have 14. Kako? You had 301. <laughs> wow, 301. Akko, 310. <laughs> Over 300 bowls each, and I managed to eat 14. Wow. And afterwards, they actually sat and ate lunch with us too. You're going to be paying for this in about an hour or two. <laughs> And I think it's best to leave it there. <laughs> Despite their weird love of watching people eat ridiculously huge amounts of food, the Japanese are, of course, famous for having a very healthy diet and the lowest obesity rates of any nation on Earth. However, if you head to the east side of Tokyo, to Ryogoku district, you'd be excused for doubting that fact. 
This is the home of Japan's national sport, sumo. And while sumo wrestlers are still amongst the most admired sports stars in Japan, their diet is a million miles from that of pretty much any other elite athlete. I'm not exactly the best person to consult on the diet of an elite athlete, but it's probably good complex carbs, lean protein after training, probably chicken or fish, no alcohol, no burgers, oh, and those horrible energy drinks. Paul's been given special permission to visit a sumo stable to watch a training session and eat a sumo brunch. And he's excited because he's going to the famous Musashigawa stable, where the trainer is a bit of a hero of his. I used to be a big fan of sumo when it was on Channel 4, and my favourite fighter was the massive Hawaiian called Kanishiki. He was incredible, just enormous, and I've been looking forward to meeting him since we arrived in Japan. We stepped off a, a pretty minor street, and then as soon as we slid the doors open and walked in the dojo, you went back 300 years. Everybody was listening to the masters, and there was respect. You were in a very special place. And then I got to meet Kanishki. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of you. I'm so to meet you. I remember watching you came out, and it was, it was your size. Because even the Japanese guys were nowhere near yeah. your size. I was the biggest, you were. heaviest in sumo history. At his biggest, Konishki weighed an incredible 46 stone. And look, he even makes Paul look tiny. There are 19 sumo wrestlers in this stable, and the small building is a lot more than just a gym for them. They live here cooking, eating, sleeping and training under the watchful eye of stable boss and former sumo champion, Musashi Maru. I got to the stable at 7am and by that time, the guys had already been training for an hour and they were still on warm-up. They train for a minimum of four hours every day, but if the stable boss doesn't think they're working hard enough, it can go on a lot longer. He has to see you practice good to, to make the day finish early. Like we can sit here and like go 12, 1 o'clock if you're not practicing the way he sees you should. It's just full on, full on. <laughs> full on and then like if, you, if you're not doing good, the boss is going to keep on going. <laughs> Training hard though is only half the story of becoming a great sumo. The other half is all about eating. What about your diet? It's two meals a day. We only eat two meals a day. Just two meals a day? Two meals a day. And your calorie intake, what sort of levels are you looking at? I think at? average for one meal, probably, <coughs> this boy's a meal, probably anything between four, four to six, maybe. Thousand. Per, thousand per thousand meal. calories, wow. Four to six thousand calories per meal. That's up to 12,000 calories per day. To put that into context, in the UK, the average bloke, like me, is recommended to eat two and a half thousand calories per day. They're eating five times that. Like, there's no breakfast. These guys, we, we, we practice on an empty stomach. We're not allowed to drink anything, too. Well, surely you, you need to put the weight on. Yeah, but when you go to hard practice, there's hours of practice, so you can tell who ate. Our first move is after practice. It's like a brunch, lunch. <laughs> and what sort of food? It's like a stew. It contains a lot of protein and a lot of vegetables at the same time. Is there any chance would you allow me to go and make something for you guys? To I eat? think the boss, you gotta ask the boss. Is it okay if I go and bake something for you guys to eat? Thank you. Are you a cook too? Oh uh, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> As the training continues, Paul tucks himself into the tiny kitchen and does what he does best. He makes bread. Making a flat bread, a very quick flat bread. Professional sumo dates back almost 400 years, and many of the original fighters were out of work samurai. As the years passed, it became clear that size mattered when trying to win a bout, so sumo wrestlers got bigger and bigger. 
The reason why this dough has moved so quick is because the heat in here from the sumo guys in there, it, it's very humid. And you expect it to be a bit sweaty smelling. It isn't at all. Cleanliness in the whole body is a really important part of sumo as well. Oh, yeah. With training finally over, Paul's quickly joined in the kitchen by some very hungry and very scantily clad young men. I found it a little bit disconcerting when uh, one of the sumo guys came in, she sort of went. One of the first things that new recruits to a sumo stable are taught is to cook the main dish that has been eaten by generations of sumo wrestlers to build bulk. Look at that. A massive pot of protein-rich stew called chankonabe. And what's in that? えっと、今人参大根をまず入れて先に茹でてます。あと他にはこれからえっと砂糖、砂糖を入れた後、これがこれが味が完成したらえっと、えのきにしめじ油揚げ、ネギをまず入れて、それがまた煮立ったらえっ
you're on the pop as well, are you? Uh, yes. <laughs> this is the beauty of being a tour guide. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. First up, we tried gyoza. Gyoza are thin, half-steamed, half-fried pancakes stuffed with minced pork and veg. Now, I've had gyoza before, I was familiar with them, and I love them. But these, wow. I mean, that is absolutely delicious. Now, I know they're generally around Japan, eating and drinking on the streets is frowned upon, but on Osaka, it's actually encouraged. Right, where are we going to next? Let's go to takoyaki, oh. octopus dumplings. Is it cooked? Yes. It's cooked. <laughs> it's not raw. <laughs> really? I've had a lot of raw fish. <laughs> Takoyaki is apparently Osaka's famous food. What it is, is basically fish balls which are filled with octopus tentacles. I love watching the way they form these balls just with the wooden skewer. It was so fast and so deft at it. And one of the most popular Japanese people's snack. People say it's Osaka people's soul food. Thank you. It can be very hot, so please be careful. Really? Be careful. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're very yeah. brave. Ah. Ooh, ooh. This is typical Osaka <laughs> style. Right? Enjoy the heat. Uh, <laughs> it's literally lava. You saw they cooked, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did, I don't why know why. Do I just thought it'd be cool by that. I'm real Osaka, so when I eat it, I'll never be like oh, anymore. I'm used to it. Eat properly. Yeah. You're, don't feed me that. <laughs> they taste amazing. I mean, the batter's very light on the oh, outside. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the octopus inside is delicious. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I think I've lost the roof of my mouth. <laughs> it's now hanging in tatters. I think beer will I heal you. I should have got a beer. Yeah, a beer that. will heal you. <laughs> Next stop, Showa Taishu Hormon for another Osaka delicacy. So what are we going to eat here, then? What, what, what's the next yes, dish? We are going to have the Horumon. The what? Horumon. All fowls. <laughs> in exactly. the of the cow. <laughs> in the local dialect, Horumon means what's to be thrown away. Made from beef or pork offal, it was invented in 1940s Osaka at a time of widespread food shortages. The first one here, this is a small intestines. And the other one is a cartridge of the throat. Oh, yeah. Yes, typical cartridge. So I'm guessing you know what Wagyu beef is, right? It's famous globally as being the best beef in the world. And Osaka is slap bang in the middle of Wagyu country. But this is part of the cow I didn't think I was ever going to eat. First up for Paul, intestines. <laughs> Sinking. <laughs> no, I know he likes it. The flavour is good. The texture is a bit rubbery. That's what we enjoy, chewing, chewing, and chewing. <laughs> Can't wait to try the throat. Go try it first. You've not had this before, have you? <laughs> chewy. <laughs> it's it's the really unique, actually. Oh, that's not a good word. <laughs> you can't eat that. It's like chewing on a bit of rubber. Mm. Now, can we please try and find some beef? A beef, yes, different. Yeah. Finally, we were heading for Wagyu. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, beef. Go Outside of Japan, the most famous type of Wagyu is Kobe beef. And in Osaka, if you've got deep pockets, you can buy the very best Kobe beef from a street stall. Oh, yeah, that. That's marvellous. I mean, it's that marbly. It looks like salmon. And how much is that piece? Uh, 10,000 yen. What, 70 Ooh. quid? Ooh, 70 quid on street food. You know how good it is, right? It's very, very expensive. I know that, but wow. I mean, when you're in Japan, you've got to have it. All Wagyu meats are graded by experts. A to C is the yield, and one to five is the quality. And there, in a street stall in the middle of Osaka, is the best Wagyu in the world, A5. I'm dribbling. This is going to be amazing. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato Wow, look at that. Don't drop it. Back away, <laughs> back away. Okay, there it's okay, go. guys. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That is stunning. Exactly. More than anything. One of my favorite cameramen here. Honestly, when he eats this, I know he's never had anything like this before. No, yeah. This, this is for you now. Yeah. There you go, mate. Try that. Honestly. Now tell me that's not the best meat you've ever had. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest, yeah. By a long Isn't way. it? Yeah. That's incredible. It, you don't chew it, do you? It falls to pieces. Do you know what? It's one of the best meals I've had in Japan. <laughs> yeah. This one. That, on really? the street in Osaka, with a beer, You're... with my friends. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you. Come back. Osaka. Come back. Thank you. To Osaka. <laughs> yeah. And Kobe beef. <laughs> Well, that certainly ended Paul's Japanese food adventure on a happy right. note, didn't it? Right, I'm going to get another one. All things considered, it's been a fantastic three weeks in a whole host of ways. And it appears that Mr Hollywood has caught a serious bout of Japanophilia. I love Japan. Whatever they do, they strive to be the best. Do you know what? They actually achieve it. Even down to growing strawberries or making a simple ramen. The guy's got a Michelin star. The tempura I had in Tokyo, it was the best fish I've ever had in my life. Thank you. I'm a happy man. Thank you for bringing me here. And their bread. I'm going back to the UK to try and replicate it. I had a cheese and ham sandwich in Kyoto, away from the crew. Let me tell you this, it was the best cheese and ham sandwich I've ever had in my life in Japan. Wherever we went, there was this constant striving to become the best. Not the richest, not the most famous, not to be celebrities, but to be the best in their field. I'm so impressed with Japanese food. I would definitely come back. <laughs>